So we had an election on Tuesday, and the results are absolutely fascinating. So this is from Vox. Voters all over the country headed to the polls to decide local and state elections. The headline-grabbing contest was Democrat Andy Bashir beating Republican incumbent Governor Matt Bevin in the Kentucky governor's race. A state president, Donald Trump, won by a whopping 30% in 2016. Some caveats. Bevin was among the most unpopular governors in the country, and other Republican leaders in the state outperformed him on Tuesday. But Bashir's win was still a big loss for Trump, who campaigned in Kentucky just a day before the election, explicitly tying Bevin's race to his own reputation. The results also showed that Democrats in Kentucky, excuse me, were fired up. Bashir outperformed the 2015 Democratic gubernatorial candidate in many areas of the state. The other huge story was Virginia's state legislature elections, where Democrats flipped both the state and or excuse me, both the state House and Senate, ensuring a trifecta with Governor Ralph Northam already in the governor's mansion. So um, <laughs> there's a funny little thing about politics. Uh, Northam was the Democrat who had a blackface scandal. He apparently wore blackface in like college or something. Um, and then also, if you guys remember, Justin Trudeau had a blackface scandal as well in Canada, and he apparently wore blackface about 732 times. <laughs> there were so many pictures of him in blackface. Everybody's like, did you do it like every Saturday or something? Like, what's wrong with you? But anyway... Uh, Trudeau got reelected and Northam got reelected. So now conventional wisdom is going to become, wow, if you want to win elections, wear blackface. <laughs> I'm obviously joking about that, but it's funny how, like, there's no, there are no shortcuts in politics. And whenever, whether people on the right or people on the left try to use, like, PC outrage as a main motivating factor in an election, it just won't work. So anyway, another guy who wore blackface um, won an election. So. This is all pretty good news. Now, I want to give you some more information. There was another big victory, which is New York City approved ranked choice voting. That was on the ballot as a, you know, direct ballot initiative, ballot provision, where the people got to directly vote on it. And it was a crushing victory. I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's somewhere between 65% and 75% of voters in New York City that want ranked choice voting. So this gets back to something that I've been talking a lot about lately. I, you know, almost made it a centerpiece of my uh, conversation with Joe Rogan that we should have a federal direct ballot initiative law. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand because the counter arguments are obvious, right? The counter arguments are, okay, well, what happened if the year was 1959 and you decided to vote on ending segregation at the national level? What would have happened? People would have been pro-segregation. So this is not the best way to go. But you have to remember, we have a constitution in this country. And I'm not talking about scrapping the constitution and doing, you know, mob rule, majoritarian rule in every aspect of our lives. I believe we should have a constitution. People should have rights which are off the table. Obviously, being equal under the law is one of those things that's off the table. And then outside of the things that are rights, outside of your constitutional protections, that's where the direct ballot initiatives come into play. And that's where you get a version of direct democracy that also protects constitutional rights and civil liberties. So, you know, the response to that is pretty simple. It's where I'm not talking about scrapping the Constitution. You can't democratically vote to overturn, like, free speech, for example. That's in there and that ain't going nowhere. And it should stay in there and not go anywhere. So having a constitution is very important. But outside of that, direct democracy is very good. And again, guys, over 80% of the time, the side that I think is the most reasonable side ends up winning when you have a, a direct vote on it. So this is just another example of that happening here. Now, the only downside of these elections, as far as I could tell, maybe I missed a, you know, a handful of uh, things here or there, but Amazon poured $1.4 million into the Seattle City Council races and left candidates got defeated in Seattle. So Lee Fong tweeted about this. He said, Amazon poured $1.4 million into Seattle City Council races, emphasizing commitment to diversity and gay rights to defeat Democratic socialists and left-leaning Democrats who dared raise taxes to pay for health care and homeless services. So this is interesting because when you have an area that is um, overwhelmingly partisan in a Democratic direction, 
the real fight there is not Democrat versus Republican. The real fight there is which wing of the Democratic Party do you want? And it's now like a, a tried and true purposeful strategy from corporate centrists that we're going to go all in on the language of identity politics and the language of you know, commitment to diversity and gay rights. Now, obviously, I'm 100% in favor of gay rights. I also am 100% in favor of the further left candidates. And it is this bait and switch and this little trick that's being used now from corporate centrists where they try to make you think, they try to outflank the further left candidates on the left by finding little areas where their rhetoric can appear to outflank them on the left. And then also when you mix that in with... Um, the fact that Amazon's, you know, funding, giving a tremendous amount of money to the worst candidates, to the centrist candidates, that can be a destructive mix. And that's what happens. So, you know, one of the best and furthest left lawmakers in the country, uh, Kashama Sawant, um, as of right now, lost her race. I think they're doing some sort of a recount thing or whatever it might be, but it looks like she's going to lose. By the way, the same thing with the Bevin versus Bashir race, the Kentucky governor's race here, is they're also doing like a, a recount because, you know, Bashir won by like 0.5 percentage points. So, I mean, that's close enough where Bevin wants a recount. We better watch out for some for some fuckery because, you know, this is something that we've seen, unfortunately, time and time again, where the Republicans will get really tricky and sleazy and sometimes just outright steal elections. And, um, you know, we saw it with Stacey Abrams. I mean, that election was flat out stolen from her. So anyway, the downside is Kashama Sawan is gone. Uh, big money still has a giant impact in elections. The left was defeated in, um, in Seattle. But everywhere else, the Democrats did really well. Now, here's the thing, guys. You just better hope that the national Democrats don't learn the wrong lessons from this. Because when you go to um, Kentucky... And by the way, credit to the Hill TV because, you know, Crystal went to Kentucky and, and Sagar and Crystal covered it. And basically the main focus of this election in Kentucky was not, you know, Ukraine gate or Russia gate or the impeachment narrative and all that stuff. No, the main focus, and obviously this is state level politics, so it wouldn't be that national level stuff, but it was on um, teachers healthcare and education. This is what the main focus was, unionization. So when Democrats focus on the bread and butter issues, when Democrats stick to the fundamentals, the Republicans are screwed because the nominal Democratic positions, the left positions on the basic bread and butter issues, the Democrats are way more popular on those things. When you're talking about unionization, when you're talking about, you know, minimum wage, when you're talking about healthcare, I mean, quite literally, Democratic governors around the country they're all in favor of the Medicaid expansion. The Medicaid expansion was a provision of Obamacare, which was an incredibly popular provision, which basically said, um, we're going to use uh, Medicaid. Did I say Medicare before? Medicaid, the Medicaid expansion. We're going to use Medicaid and raise that line for people who are eligible to 132% of the poverty line. So it expands Medicaid by millions of people around the country, gives millions of people more health care, and prevents like literal deaths. Like, you are saving lives. There was a study on this where over 10,000 people die since Republican governors refused the Medicaid expansion. Many of them did that. So the Democrats are running on expanding Medicaid, which is the Democrats running on, I'm in favor of more people getting health care than the Republican is. So when you run on the bread and butter issues, you are forcing the Republicans to defend the more unpopular position, and they can't do it, and they lose. And that's what happened here. There was tremendous union organizing that happened in Kentucky. The, uh, the Democrats stuck to the bread and butter issues. Now, I'm sure Bashir is way more centrist than, you know, than my tastes. But what you're seeing is, again, when you have a race and you stick to the basics, you can win. Now, Bevin was just solely relying on, you know, Daddy Trump to come in there and help him. And remember, this really is one of the most unpopular governors in the country. And there's... So there are a few stories I remember because I covered Bevin a bunch of times because he's just such a maniac. Uh, one of the things that he made national news for, he said that uh, he blamed he blamed child abuse on the teacher strike that was going on there. <laughs> he said the teacher strike is leading to child abuse. He said if you aren't employed, you don't deserve health care. 
This is a guy who was the governor of Kentucky. Um, he said, we can't legalize weed because of the overdoses. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, you have to be able to beat this guy. If you can't beat this guy, it's just beyond pathetic. Um, he he literally proposed a prayer group to try to reduce crime. One of the things he focused on was requiring all government documents in Kentucky to say, in the year of our Lord. And by the way, he got that through. So this, like, this is the stuff that he's focusing on. He called for civil war if Hillary Clinton won. Um, he promised to gut Medicaid, and he did. He refused the Medicaid expansion. So, listen, it's great that the Democrats won here, but you have to take away the, the right lesson. My fear is the National Democrats will go, oh, so let's just keep talking about Ukraine and keep talking about impeachment and keep talking about these sideshow issues, which are not directly related to policy. But no, the way Bashir won was talking about policy, the way the Kentucky Democrats won was focusing on health care, focusing on education, and putting the Republicans in a position where they had to defend their, their unpopular policy positions. So, mostly a positive election, but don't get too comfortable, by the way, don't get too comfortable, because this is something that, of course, could happen. There, the, the lesson from this could be, from people who are wrong, could be, oh, well, no matter what, we're going to do well if you're on the Democratic side. No. No. Because um, the Republicans are not going to stop going on the offense. Trump is not going to stop doing his rallies. And they will shore up their base. And this might be a wake-up call to them for 2020. So you can't relax. You know, you can't uh, run corporate centrists. You have to stick to the fundamentals, stick to the bread and butter issues, and go hard in the paint, man. So anyway, largely positive election results. Um, but yet again, we see big money rules the day in, in Seattle, and we, we lost Kashama Sawant's seat. But just take the right lesson away from this. That's the most important thing.